Democracy in Ancient India by Steve Mulber, Associate Professor of History in Nepansang University. Historians who are interested in democracy often insist it must be understood in context of a unique Western tradition of political development beginning with the Greeks. The spread of democratic ideals and practice to other cultures or their failure to spread have many times been explained on the assumption that democracy or personal liberty are ideals foreign to the Eastern world, an assumption at least as old as Herodotus. But events since the late 1980s have shown that people both in Western and non-Western countries have a lively interest in democracy as something relevant to their own situation. The old assumption deserves to be re-examined. In fact, the supposed differences between Western and Eastern cultures are in this case, as in so many others, more a matter of ideological faith than a cool, impartial judgment. If we are talking about the history of humanity as a whole, democracy is equally new or equally old everywhere. Fair and effective elections under adult suffrage and in conditions that allows the free discussion of ideas are a phenomenon of this century. The history of democracy properly so-called is just beginning. The prehistory of democracy, however, is scarcely restricted to Europe and Europeanized America and Australasia. A search of world history finds much worth studying. There are no perfect democracies waiting to be discovered. But there is something else, a long history of government by discussion, in which groups of people having common interest make decisions that affect their lives through debate, consultation and voting. The vast majority of such groups, it may be objected or more properly called oligarchies than democracies. But every democracy has been created by widening what was originally a narrow franchise. The history of government by discussion, which may be called republicanism for brevity's sake, has a claim to interest of anyone who takes democracy seriously. This article will examine one important case of government by discussion, the republics of ancient India. Although they are familiar to Indologists, these republics are hardly known to other historians. They deserve, however, a substantial place in the world historiography. The experience of ancient India with republicanism, if better known, would be by itself make democracy seem less of a freakish development and help dispel the common idea that the very concept of democracy is specially Western. The present article has two goals. First, it will summarize the history of ancient India republics as it currently known. This survey is restricted to North India and the period before about 400 AD when sovereign republics seems to have been extinct. Second, the article will examine the historiographical evaluation of the Indian Republican experience and suggest that most of them have placed it in na too narrow a context. Ancient Indian democratic experiments, it will be argued, are more important than they are usually granted to be. It is well known that the sources of the ancient India history present considerable difficulties. All the indigenous ancient literature from the subcontinent has been preserved as part of religious tradition, Brahminical, Buddhist or Jaina. When the subject is political theory and its implementation, the pre-selected nature of sources is a distinct handicap to the researchers. The larger and most influential Indian literacy tradition, the Brahminical, is distinctly hostile to anything resembling democracy. Brahminical literature gives kingship a central place in political life and seldom hints that anything else is possible. For moral philosophers and legislators such as Manu, reputed author as Manu Smriti between 200 BC to 200 AD, the king was a key figure in a social order based on caste Varna. Caste divided society into functional classes. The Brahmans had a magical power and priestly duties. The Kshatriyas were the rulers and warriors. The Vaishyas, cultivators and businessmen, and the Sudras, the lowest part of the society, subservient to other three. More moral law or dharma depended on the observance of these divisions, and the king was the guarantor of dharma and in particular the privileges of the Brahmans. Another tradition is best exemplified by the Arthashastra of Kautilya. Around 
300 BC, which allotted the king a more independent role but likewise emphasized his responsibility for peace, justice, and stability. Both Kautilya's work and the Manuspriti are considered classic explorations of ancient Indian political and social theory. A reader of these or other Brahminical treatises finds it very easy to visualize ancient Indian society as one where monarchy was the normal form of the state. Until the end of the last century, the only indication that this might not always have been the case came from the Greek and Roman accounts of India. Mostly histories of India during and just after Alexander the Great's invasion of India in 327 to 324 BC. These works spoke of numerous cities and even larger areas being governed as oligarchies and democracies. But they were not always believed by scholars. Yet, research into the Buddhist Pali Canon during the 19th century confirmed this picture of widespread republicanism. The Pali Canon is the earliest version of Buddhist scriptures and reached its final form between 400 to 300 BC. It contains the story of Buddha's life and teachings and his rules for monastic communities. The rules and teachings are presented in form of antidotes, explaining the circumstances that called forth the Buddha's authoritative pronouncement. Thus, the Pali Canon provides us with many details of life in ancient India and specifically of the 6th century, the Buddha's lifetime in the Northeast. In 1903, T.W. Reis David, the leading Pali scholar, pointed out in his book Buddhist India that the canon and the Jatakas, a series of Buddhist legends set in the same period but composed much later, depicted a country in which there were many clans dominating extensive and populous territories who made their public decisions in assembling moods and parliaments. Reis David observation was not made in a vacuum. Throughout the 19th century, students of local government in India, many of them British bureaucrats, had been fascinated by popular elements in village life. The analysis of village government was part of a continuous debate on the goals and methods of the imperial policy and the future of the India as the self-governing country. Res David's book made the ancient institutions of India relevant to this debate. His reconstruction of republican past for India was taken up by the nationalistic Indian scholars of the 1910s. Later generation of Indian scholars have been somewhat embraced by the enthusiasm of their elders for early republics and have sought to treat the republics in a more balanced and dispassionate manner. Nevertheless, their work, like that of the pioneering nationalist, has been extremely productive. Not only the classical sources of the Pali Canon, but also Buddhist work in Sanskrit, Panani, Sanskrit grammar, the Astha Adhyayi, Mahabharata, the Jaina Canon, and even Kautilya's Arthashastra have been combed for evidence and insights. Coins and inscriptions have documented the existence of republics and the workings of a popular assemblies. The work of 20th century scholars has made possible a much different view of ancient political life in India. It has shown us a landscape with kings a plenty, culture where the terminology of a rule is in the majority of sources relentlessly monarchical, but where at the same time the realities of politics are so complex that simply to call them monarchical is a grave, grave distortion. Indeed, in ancient India, monarchical thinking was constantly battling with another vision of self-rule by member of a guild, a village or an extant kin group. In other words, any group of an equal with a common set of interest. This vision of comparative self-government often produced republicanism and even democracy comparable to the classical Greek democracy. True evidence for non-monarchical government goes back to the Vedas. Republican politics were most common and vigorous stood in the Buddhist period, 600 BC to 200 AD. At this time, India was the thorus of urbanization. The Pali Canon gave the picturesque description of the city of Vasali in the 5th century BC as possessing 707 stored uh, buildings and 7,707 7, pinnacled buildings, 7,707 parks and lotus ponds and multitude of people, including the famous courtesan Am Ambapalli. 
whose beauty and artistic achievement contributed to uh, the mightily to the city's prosperity and reputation. The cities of Kapilavathu and Kasuvati were likewise full of uh, traffic and noise. Moving between these cities were great trading caravans of 500 to 1000 cars, figures that convey no precise measurement but give a true feeling of scale. Caravans that stopped are more than four months in a single place, as they often did uh, because of the rainy season, were described as villages. Religion too was taking to the road. The hereditary uh, Brahman, who was also a householder, as in latter Vedic tradition, saw his teachings, authority and prerequisites threatened by wandering holy men and self-appointed teachers. There were warlords kings uh, who sought to control this fluid society, some with a major of success, but the literature, Pali and Sanskrit, Buddhist and Brahminical shows that non-monarchical forms of government were omnipresent. This was a complex vocabulary to describe the different types of groups that ran their own affairs. Some of these were obviously war uh, warrior bands, others more peaceful groups with economic goals, some religious brotherhoods. Such an organization of whatever type could be designated almost indifferently as a Ghana or Sangha. And uh, similar uh, through less important bodies were labeled with the terms Sreni, Pugga, Vratta, Ghana and Sangha. The most important of these terms originally meant multitude. By the 6th century BC, these words meant both a self-governing uh, multitude in which decisions were made by the members working in common and the self-style of a government characteristics of such groups. In the case of the strongest of such groups, which acted as sovereign government, the words are best translated as republic. That there were many sovereign republics in India is easily demonstrated from a number of sources. Perhaps it is best to begin with the Greek evidence. Even though it is not the earliest, simply because the Greek writer spoke in a political language that is familiar. Perhaps the most useful Greek account to India is Arian Anabasis of Alexander, which describes the Macedonian conqueror's campaign in great detail. The Anabasis, which is derived from the eyewitness account of Alexander Campanians, portrays him as meeting free and independent Indian communities at every turn. And free and independent means it's illustrated from the case of Nyasa, a city of a border of modern Afghanistan and Pakistan that was ruled by present name Akulpis and a council of 300. After surrendering to Alexander, Akulpis used the city's uh, supposed connection with the god Dionysus to seek Leninian terms from the king. The nation Bishia Thi O king, out of the respect of for Dionysus to allow them to remain free and independent, for when Dionysus had subjugated the nations of India, he found this city for the soldiers who had become unfit for the military service. From that time he has inhabited, inhabit NASA, a free city, and we ourselves are independent, conducting our government with constitutional order. NASA was a Greek term and oligarchy, as further discussion between Alexander and Archipelus, Akulfis, rebels, and the single city-state. There were other Indian states that were both larger in area and wider in franchise. It is clear that from Aryan that the Malian Republic consisted of a number of cities, Q, Curtis, Rufus, and Diodorus, Sicilus. In the uh, histories of Alexander mention a people called Sabarkia and Sambashia among from the form of government was democratic and not uh, regal. The Sabarka Sambashia, like the millions, uh, had a large state. Their army consisted 60,000 uh, foot, 6,000 cavalry, 500 uh, carriers. Thus, Indian republics of the late 4th century could be much larger than the contemporaneous uh, Greek polis. And it seems that in the northwestern part of India, republicanism was the norm. Alexander's historian mentioned a large number of republics, some named, some not, and only a handful of kings. The prevalence of republicanism and its democratic form is explicitly 
uh, stated by Diodorus Siculus. After describing the mythical monarchs who succeeded the gods Dionysus as a ruler of India, he says, "Last, at last, however, after many years had gone, most of the cities adopted the democratic form of government. Through some retained the kingly until the invasion of the country by the Alexander." What makes this statement particularly interesting is that it seems to derive from the first-hand description of India by a Greek traveler named Megasthenes. Around 300 BC, about two decades after Alexander's invasion, Megasthenes served as ambassador to the Greek king Seleucus, Nicator to the Indian emperor Chandragupta Maurya, and in the course of his duties, crossed northern India to the eastern uh, city of Patna. where he lived for a while if this statement is drawn from megasthenes then the picture of the northwestern india dominated by republics must be extended to the entire northern half of the subcontinent if we turn to the indian sources we find that there is nothing far uh, fetched about this idea the most useful sources for mapping north india are three the pali canon which shows us northern uh, northeastern India between the Himalayas and Gangas in the 6th and the 5th century BC the grammar of Apanni which discusses all of north india with a focus on the northwest during the 5th century and the kautilya's arthashastra which is the product of a 4th century roughly contemporaneous uh, with megasthenes all three sources enable us to identify numerous sanghas ganas some very minor other larger and powerful what were uh, these republics politics polities like according to panani all the states and regions janapadas of northern india during his time were based on the settlement or conquest of the given area by the identified warrior people who still dominated the political life of that area some of these people in panani's term janapadans were subject to king who was at least in theory of their own blood and was perhaps dependent on their special support elsewhere the janpandanis ran their affairs in a republican manner thus in both kinds of state the government was dominated by people classified by as kshatriyas or as later ages would it be member of warrior caste but in many states perhaps most political participation was restricted to a subject of all kshatriyas one need not to be just a warrior but a member of a specific royal clan the rajanya evidence from the number of the sources shows that the enfranchised members of the many republics including the buddha's own sakyas and lichavas with whom he was very familiar considered themselves to be the royal descendants even brother kings the term raja which is a monarchy certainly meant king in a state with gana and sangha constitution could be designated someone who held a share in sovereignty in such places it seems likely that political power was restricted to the heads of a restricted number of royal families rajkulas among the ruling clan the heads of these families were uh, consecrated as kings and thereafter took part of deliberation of the state our indian republics are beginning to sound extremely undemocratic by the modern standards with real power concentrated in the hands of few patriarchy patriarch uh, representing the leading lineage of one privileged section of a warrior caste a reader who has formed uh, this impression is not entirely mistaken no doubt the rulers of most republics thought of their gana as closed the club as did the citizens of athens who also defined themselves as hereditary privileged group but as in ancient athens there are other factors which modify the picture and make it an interesting one for the student of democracy first the closed nature of the ruling class is easy to exaggerate republics were only descendant of the certain families held powers were common but there was another type in which power was shared by all kshatriyas families this may not sound like much of the difference since the restriction of the warrior caste seems to remain but this is an anor- anarchonistic view of the social condition of the time varnas of the pre christian era india were not the caste of later period with other prohibition of the intermarriage and the commonality of with other groups 
rather they were con uh, constructs of theorist much like the division of the three orders priest warriors and burghers beloved by european writers of the early middle ages such a classification was useful for debating purposes not uh, but was not a fact of daily existence those a republics that reopened the political process to all kshatriyas were not extended extending the franchise from one clearly defined group to another albeit a larger one but to all those who could claim and justify the claim to be capable of ruling and fighting other evidence suggests that in some states the in, uh, franchised groups was even wider such a development in hinted at a kautilya according to him there were two kinds of janpadas ayudhi ayudhya and praya those made up mostly of soldiers and shreni praya those compromise uh, comprising guilds of scar craftsmen trader and agriculturist the first were political entities where military tradition alone defined those worthy of power while the second would seem to be communities where wealth derived from peaceful economic activity gave some access to the political process this interpretation is supported by the fact that shreni or guilds based on an economic interest may often both part of the armed forces of the state and recognized as having jurisdiction over their own members in the indian republics as in the greek policies or the european cities in the high middle ages economic expansion enabled new groups to take up arms and eventually demand a share in sovereignty if it was not granted one could always form one's own mini state panini's picture of stable long established janapadas is certainly the illusion of a systemizing grammarian as panini's most true modern student was put it there was a craze for constituting new publics republics which had reached its climax to the vahika country and northwest india where clans constituting of as many as 100 families only organized themselves as ganas furthermore power in some republics was vested in a large number of individuals in a well known jataka tell we are told that the lichia v capital of versali there were 7707 kings rajas and 7707 viceroys 7707 generals and 7707 treasurers these figures since they come from the uh, about half a millennium after the period they describe have little evidentiary value despite the indigenous efforts of the scholars to find the core of hard fact the tale does not give us the number of lichavi ruling families rajkulas the size of the lichavi is uh, assembly or any real clues of the population of vasali it the jataka does retain the memory of an undisputed feature of indian republicanism the rulers were many the same memory can be found in other sources especially in the uh, those critical of republicanism the lila lilavati vistara in an obvious historical jab depicts vesali as being full of lichavi rajans each one thinking i am king i am king and thus a place where pity age and rank were ignored the sanati parva section of mahabharatla shows the participation of too many people in the affairs of the state as being a great flaw in the republicanism of polity the gana leaders should be respected as worldly affairs of the ganas dependent to the great extent upon them the spy department and the secrecy of council should be reft to the chiefs for it is not fit that the entire body of the gana should hear those secret matters the chief of the ganas should carry out uh, together in secret works leading to the prosperity of the gana otherwise the wealth of gana decays and it meets with danger the uh, jaina work again criticizes gana for being disor disorderly the monks and nuns who frequent them will find themselves bullied beaten robbed or accused of being sp uh, spies the numerous numbers of a sovereign gana or sanghatha 
interacted with each other as member of an assembly details of working of such assemblies can be found both in brahmanical and buddhist literature by the time of a panini 5th century bc there were a terminology for the process of corporate decision making panini gives a term for vote decision reached by voting the compilation completion of the quorum Another cluster of words indicates that the division of assemblies into political parties was well known. Further, Panini and his commentators show that sometimes a smaller select group within the Sangha had special functions, acting as an executive or perhaps as a committees for defined purposes. The Pali canon uh, gives a much fuller it is somewhat indirect the depiction of democratic institution in india confirming and extending the picture of found in panini this is found in the three of the earliest and most revered parts of the canon the maha parinibbana sutanta the mahavega and kulavagga these works taken together preserve the buddha's instruction uh, for proper running of the buddhist monastic brotherhood the sangha after his death they are the best source for voting procedures in a corporate body in the earliest part of the buddhist period they also give some uh, insight into the development of the democratic ideology the rules of conducting the buddhist sangha were according to the first chapter of the maha uh, parinibbana sutanta based in principle on those commonly found in political sanghas or ganas in the case of buddhist sangha the key organizational virtue was full participation of all monks in the ritual and disciplinary acts of their group to assure that this would be remembered detailed rules concerning the vote voting in monastic assemblies their membership and their quorums were set down in the mahag mahavagga and kalavagga business could not be transacted legitimately in a full assembly by a vote of all members if for example a candidate wanted to upasambada ordination the question natti was put in the sangha by a learned and competent member and other members asked three times to indicate the dissent if there uh, was none the sangha was taken to be in agreement with the natti the decision was finalized by the proclamation of the decision of the sangha in many cases as the granting of upasampada ordination anonymity of full assembly was required of course anonymity was not possi uh, always possible the kulavagga provides other techniques that were used in disputes specially dangerous of the unity of the sangha those which concerned interpretation of the monastic rule itself if such a dispute had generated into bitter and confused debate it could be decided by majority vote or referred to a jury or committee specially elected by the sangha to treat the matter at hand it is here that we see a curious combination of well developed democratic procedure and fear of democracy the rules of taking votes sanctioned the disallowance by the vote taker of results that threatened the essential law of the sangha and or its unity it if the voting procedure in is less than free the idea that only a free vote could decide continuous issues in the strongly present no decision could be made until the uh, semblance of agreements had been reached such manipulations of votings were introduced because of the buddhist elders were very concerned about survival of the religious enterprise disunity of the membership was great fear of all indian republics and corporations it the idea of free vote could not be repudiated the kulvoga illustrates a conflict within the buddhist sangha during its earliest centuries between democratic principles and a philosophy that was willing in the name of the unity and to sacrifice them since the rules of the buddhist sangha are by far the best known from the period we have seen discussing it is tempting to identify them with the rules of a political ganas particularly those which uh, lichavas or vajjanas vajjians 
सिंस बुद्धा मेड अ क्लियर कनेक्शन बिटवीन द प्रिंसिपल्स एप्लीकेबल टू द लिचावी पॉलिटी एंड दोज ऑफ हिज संघा बट From early on, scholars have recognized that the Buddhist constitution was not an exact imitation of any other. For instance, sovereign republics had a small elected executive committee to manage the affairs of the Gana when the whole membership of Gana was unable to be assembled. But neither did uh, the Buddha or his earliest followers invent their complex and carefully formulated parliamentary uh, procedures out of a whole cloth. Arya's Rajamudra's conclusion first formulated in 1918 still seems valid the techniques seen in the Buddhist sangha reflect a sophisticated and widespread political culture based on a popular assembly similarly the value placed on full participation of members in the affairs of their sangha must reflect the ideology of those who believed in the sangha gana form of government in the political sphere The Buddha's commitment of republicanism or at least the ideal of republican virtues was a strong one. If we are to believe the Maha uh, Parinibbana Sutanta among the oldest Buddhist texts as a, uh, as is common in the Buddhist scriptures a precept is illustrated by a story. Here Ajata Shatru a king of Magadha wishes to destroy the Vijayan confederacy here the Lechivas and sends a minister vaskara the brahman to the buddha to ask his advice will his attack be a success rather than answer directly the buddha speaks to anand anand ananda uh, his closest disciples have you heard ananda that virgins hold the full and frequent republic assemblies lord so i have heard replied he so long ananda rejoined the uh, blessed one as the virginas hold those full and frequent public assemblies so long may they be expected not to decline but to prosper in the series of rhetorical questions to the ananda the buddha outlines other requirement of virgin prosperity so long ananda as the virgins meet together in concord and rise in concord and carry out their undertaking in concord so long as they enact nothing not already established abrogate nothing that has been already enacted and act in accordance with the ancient institutions of the vajanas as established in former days so long as they honor and esteem and revere and support the vajana elders and hold it a point of duty to hearken to their words so long as no women or girl belonging to their clans are detained among them by the force of the abduction so long as they honor and esteem the river and support the vajana shrines in town or country and allow not to proper offerings and rites as formerly given and performed to fall into the disuetude so long as the rightful protection defense and support shall be provided to the arahats among them so that arahats from the distance may enter the realm the arahats therein may live at ease so long may the virgins be expected not to decline but to prosper then the blessed one addressed vaskara the brahman and said when i was once staying o brahman at vasali at the sarandarda temple i thought the vajanas these condition of welfare and so long as the, uh, those conditions shall continue to exist among the vajians so long as the vajians shall be well instructed in those conditions so long may we expect them not to decline but to prosper the comment of king's ambassador underlines the point of his advice so gautama the vajama vajans cannot be overcome by the king of magadha that is not in battle without diplomacy or breaking up their alliance the same story tells us that once the king envoy had departed the buddha and ananda went the meet assembly of monks buddha told the monks that they too must observe seven conditions if they were to prosper full and frequent assemblies concord preserving and not abrogating established institutions honoring elders falling not under the influence of the craving which springing up within them 
would give rise to the renewed existence delighted in a life of solitude and training their mind that good and holy men shall come to them and those who have come shall dwell at is these precepts and other that follow the set of the seven were main point of the monk who have transmitted the maha parinibbana uh, sutanta to us we however may wish to emphasize another point the buddha saw the virtues necessary for the righteous and prosperous community whether secular or monastic as being much the same foremost among these those virtues was the holding of full and frequent assemblies in this the buddha spoke not only for himself and not only out of his personal view of justice and virtue he based himself on what may be called the democratic tradition in ancient indian politics democratic in that it argued for a wide rather than narrow distribution of political rights and the de- government by discussion rather than the command and submission pali canon gives us our earliest and perhaps our best detailed look at indian republicanism its workings and political philosophy about no other republics do we much as we know do about the buddhist sangha and lichavis in the time of buddha even though we do know that republic survived and were a significant factor until perhaps the 4th century ad a period of over 800 years scattered inscription a great number of coins and occasional notice of greek sources the jatakas or other indian literature give us a few fact but any history of of indian republicanism is necessary a rather schematic one the theme that has no most attracted the attention of scholars is the constant danger to republicanism and its ultimate failure much of what we know about the sovereign ganas of india derives from the stories of attacks upon them by various conquerors it it is remarkable that for several centuries the con- uh, conspicuous successes of monarchs even the greatest uh, had only the contemporary effect on the sovereign republics and every little effect indeed on the corporate organization of guilds religious bodies and villages the reason is of course that king indian kings have seldom been as mighty as they wished to be or wished to be presented conquerors were not in position to restructure society to create states as we visualize them today rather they were usually content to give the submission of their neighbors whether they were other kings or republics these defeated rivals were often left in control of other of their own affairs merely required to pay tribute and provide troops for the conquerors next war the great emperors of ancient india including chandragupta maurya and ashok ran rather precarious realms once the center widened weakened this unraveled very quickly and society returned to its preceding complexity rival rival uh, dynasties revived as did defeated republics as altaka recognized the mere existence of warlords was not fatal to the republican tradition of politics far more important was the slow abandonment of the republican ideals by the republicans themselves we have seen that many republics were content even in the earliest days with a very exclusive definition of a political community in some ideas of wider participation gained currency and even implementation but the contrary movement is easier to document by the 3rd and 4th century ad states known to be republics in the earlier times were subject to hereditary executives eventually such republics became monarchies an evolution away from republicanism is clearly seen in the literature of politics and religion if we grant that the society depicted by pali canon in the beginning of a new era one with as an economy and culture quite distinct from the vedic period it immediately becomes obvious that the most democratic ideals as the earliest the pali canon and the uh, and to the some extent the jaina canon shows us energetic movements that rejected the hierarchicalism and caste ideology seen in vedas and brahmans in favor of more egalitarian values 
Buddhism and Jainism were scarcely exceptional. They were merely the most successful of many contemporary religious movement and left us records. It is clear from Panani that egalitarianism was an important element in the 5th century BC. He preserves a special term for the Gana where these where there was no distinction between high and low. Such Brahminical uh, classics as the Mahabharata, the writing of Kautilya and Manusmriti works that promoted hierarchy are manifestation of later movement 300 BC to 200 AD, away from the degree of egalitarianism that had been achieved. Kautilya, who is traditionally identified the chief minister of a Mauryan conqueror Chandragupta Maurya, after 300 BC, is famous for his advice of monarchs on the best way to tame or destroy Ganas through a uh, subterfuge. Perhaps a more important part of his achievement was to formulate a political science in which royalty was normal, even though his own text shows that Ganas were very important factors in politics in his time. Similarly, the accomplishment of the Manuspriti uh, was to formulate a view of society where human equality was non-existent and unthinkable. Members of Ganas were encouraged to fit themselves into a hierarchical, monarchical framework by the number of the factors. Kings were not only enemies of the Ganas, the relationship between competing Ganas must have been a constant political problem. Ganas that claimed uh, sovereignty over the certain territory were always faced by the competing claims to of other corporate groups. How were these claims to be sorted out other than by force? The king had an answer to this question. If he were acknowledged as the only monarch, Raja, chief executive of all the corporations, though he would commit himself to preserving the legitimate privilege of each of them, even protect the lesser members of each Gana from abuse of a power by their le uh, leaders. It was tempting offer, and since alternative was constant battle, it was slowly accepted, sometimes freely, sometimes under compulsion. The end result was acceptance of social order in which many Ganas and Sanghats existed, but none were sovereign and none were committed to any general egalitarian view of the society. They were committed instead to a hierarchy in which they were promised a secular place. Such a notional hierarchy seems to have been constructed in North India by the 5th century AD. Even the Buddhist Sangha accommodated itself to it, which led eventually to complete, complete victory of the rival Brahmans. This was not quite the end of the republicanism because government by discussion continued within many Ganas and Sanghas. But the idea of hierarchy and inequality of caste was increasingly dominant. The degree of corporate autonomy in latter Indian society, which is considered considerable and in uh, itself a very important fact, is in this sense a different uh, topic that one we have been following. A corporation that accepts itself as a subcaste in a great divine hierarchy is different from more uh, pugnacious Ganas and Sanghats of the Pali Canon, Kautilya and even Jataka stories. We have modern historians made of what we might call the golden age of the Indian republicanism. We have already distinguish, uh, uh, distinguished above between two eras of scholarship on the topic, the first patriotic enthusiasm and a simple thrill of discovery of unsuspected material characteristics characterized a scholar's reaction. Formal attitude was specially seen in K.P. Jaiswal, Hindu Polity, published first in article of 1911 and 1913, then as a book in 1924. Jaiswal's work was overtly aimed to show that the, his countrymen were worthy of independence from Britain. The history of Hindu institutions demonstrated an ancient talent for politics. The test of polity is its capacity to live and develop, and its contribution to the culture and the happiness of humanity. Hindu polity, judged by this test, will come out very successfully. The golden age of the Hindu's polity lies not in the past but in the future. Constitutional or social advancement is not a monopoly of any particular race. In Jaiswal's book, scholarship was not sometimes subordinated to his argument. In his discussion of ancient republics, 
which was not his only subject the evidence was pushed at least as far as it would go to portray the republic as inspiring examples of early democracy a similar or uh, through quieter satisfaction can be seen in the contemporary discussion of rc mazumdar or dr uh, bhandarkar in the second uh, period of scholarship in the year uh, since independence a more restrained attitude has been adopted by younger scholars who feel they have nothing to prove among these scholars the general tendency has been to emphasize that the republics were not real republics in the modern uh, uses that implies a universal adult suffrage the clan basis and the exclusiveness of the ruling class are much discussed sometimes writers have uh, have bent over backwards to divorce the indian republican experience from the history of democracy thus a k mazumdar's judgment that because of ganrajya all inhabitants other than the member of a raj uh, kulas which is king's family no right and were treated as inferior citizens people were actually better off in monarchies where if not the general mass at least the intellectual and commercial community enjoyed freedom in a monarchy which seems to have been lacking in a ganarajya the contrast drawn here is not backed up by any real argument and makes one's wonder wonder about how the author defines the freedom the reaction has perhaps gone too far one feels that modern scholars have still not come to grips with the existence of the widespread republicanism in a region so long thought to be home par excellence of oriental despotism republicanism now has a place in every worthwhile book about ancient india but it tends to be brushed aside so that one can get back to the main story which is development of surviving hindu tradition historians in india as elsewhere seem to feel that anything which could be so thoroughly forgotten must have had grievous flaws to begin with most historians still cannot discuss these republicans without qualifying using the qualifier tribal or clan long ago jaspar rightly protested against the use of these terms the evidence does not warrant our calling republics clans indian republics as the 7th and 6th century bc had long passed the tribal stage of society they were states ganas and samaghats through Uh, though many of them likely had a national and tribal basis as every state and ancient or modern must necessarily have he was equally correct when he pointed out that every state in ancient rome and greece was tribal in a last analysis but no constitutional historian would think of calling the republics of rome and greece were tribal organization it the phrases phrases clan and tribal republic are still routinely used today in indian context it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that they are being used pejoratively in both common and scholarly uses to label a people's institution or culture as tribal is to dismiss dismiss them from serious consideration types people are historical dead ends and their separation or absorption by more advanced cultures usually those ruled by centralizing government is taken for granted the terminology of even indian historians demonstrates the survival of an ancient but inappropriate prejudice in the general evaluation of the indian republicanism once that prejudice is overcome indian republicanism gains a strong claim to the attention of the historians especially those with an interest in comparative or world history it is specially remarkable that during the near millennium between 400 to 400 ad we need republics almost anywhere in india that our sources allows us to examine society in any details unless those sources not least uh, our greek sources are extremely deceptive the republics of india were very likely more extensive and populous than the poles polis of the greeks one cannot help wondering how in many other parts of the eurasia republican and democratic states have uh, may have coexisted with the royal dynasties 
that are staple of both ancient and modern chronology and conceptualization. This may well be an answerable ancient and question, but so far no one has even tried to investigate it. If an investigation is made, we may discover things that are so uh, as surprising to us as the republics of Indian originally were. The existence of the Indian republicanism is a discovery of the 20th century. The implications of this phenomenon have yet to be fully digested because historians of the past century have been inordinately in love with the virtues of the centralized authority and government by the experts and adhered to an evolutionary historicism that has little good to say about either direct or representative democracy. Perhaps the love affair is fading. If so, historians will find in Indian past as elsewhere plenty of raw material for a new history of the development of human government. So this was all. थैंक यू फ्रेंड्स फॉर लिसनिंग ऑल दिस अगर आप चाहते हो कि किसी और टॉपिक पे मैं ऐसा वीडियो बनाऊं डीप में जाके किसी हिस्टोरियन या फिर किसी साइकोलॉजिस्ट या फिर किसी फिलोसोफर की आर्टिकल को मैं आपको समझाऊं या फिर पढ़ सिर्फ पढूं भी तो आप मुझे कमेंट बॉक्स में लिख सकते हो एंड बी वेल एंड थैंक यू फॉर लिसनिंग